We acknowledge that this podcast is recorded on the unceded, ancestral, and occupied traditional territory of the Anishinaabe Nation, the people of the three fires known as Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi Nations. And furthermore, we thank the Chippewa of Saugeen and the Chippewa of Nawash, now known as the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, who are the traditional keepers of this land. In some parts of Canada, treaties were signed with First Nations that gave incoming settlers rights to much of the land, while in other areas, few or no treaties were signed. Unceded land was never given or legally signed away to Britain or Canada. It was stolen and continues to be occupied and governed by settlers today. As we live, work, surf and play, we say mahalo to the Métis, Inuit and Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island and from around the world who have stewarded these lands and sacred surf spots for thousands of years. We recognize their amazing resistance, resilience and strength in the face of ongoing dispossession, colonial violence and injustice. In particular, we wish for justice to be brought for the murdered and missing Indigenous children and victims of Canada's residential school system. We believe that for true healing and harmony to occur, we must end the cycle of oppression while working together as we move forward in truth and reconciliation. We can be better, we can do better. to the Permastoke podcast, Canada's surfing and sup podcast. How's it going, bro? It's going really well, Derek. Uh, thanks for having me on today. Awesome. Excited. Stoked to have you here. Where are we talking to you from? I am sitting here in uh, Squamish, BC. Nice. Now, do you sort of split your time between Squamish and somewhere up not on Haida Gwaii, but you're around the Great Bear Rainforest or something, correct? Yeah, you got it. I always say that uh, Squamish here is more like our base camp. And uh, oh, okay. we're, we're set up here in Squamish. And then with, with a lot of the products that uh, I run through the business, uh, we're sort of all over the place. But I do spend a lot of time up in the Great Bear Rainforest. That's uh, one of my favorite spots to, to spend time and to explore. But uh, unfortunately, we haven't been able to get up there the last... Uh, a uh, couple of summers just due to COVID um, uh, with the First Nations communities being being closed. So um, yeah, once everything is safe to head back up there, uh, we'll head back up. But I just, yeah, I just recently heard, you know, in the last two days that we won't be going up again this year. So it's, uh, it's mm-hmm. tough to not go back to a spot that's so close to your heart, you know, but uh, well, in due time. Yeah, that's a real bummer. But uh, I guess there's a lot at stake with those communities and not the uh, same sort of health care that we would have on the mainland. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they're small uh, communities uh, and they're vulnerable. And a lot of people from around the world come into these communities as well for tourism. So, yeah, you really have to be diligent with uh, making sure they're they're safe. Awesome. Now, Norm, I was stoked to talk to you today because... You and I, a little bit of a similar past. Um, So I'm really looking forward to hearing your perspective on things. Mm -hmm. I understand you're originally from Ontario. I'm originally from Ontario. I've since come back. I did spend 12 great years out West as as you continue to. Uh, I found stand-up paddleboarding just a few years ago. Uh, became a Paddle Canada instructor pretty quickly and have been teaching courses ever since and absolutely love it. Mm. Um, And I also came to paddleboarding via surfing, which actually originally started on the Great Lakes. So, so yeah, take me back a little bit. I'm really curious to hear about Norm Han from Sudbury. And I understand you were, I believe you were a basketball coach and a high school teacher um yeah exactly that's sort of i grew up in yes yeah, Sudbury, ontario uh, actually coniston just outside of Sudbury. so that's where my roots are that's still you know where my my family is and 
uh, yeah, I made the journey out West back in 99. But prior to that, I'd yeah, grown up on the lakes and rivers, uh, fishing. My grandfather had a cabin and so we spent, both my parents were school teachers. So we spent a lot of time in the summer on the lakes and the rivers, which, uh, I still absolutely love to this day and, and grew up in a sports family. So played hockey, basketball. I played five years university basketball and then ended up, uh, getting my, um, yeah, getting my teaching high school teaching degree and taught for a few years and then the pull of the West and wanting to spend more time in the outdoors and um, in BC uh, sort of pulled me out there and I ended up taking a guiding certification out there got all my guiding certifications and first aid and things of that sort and then yeah found so myself. So what does that entail guiding exactly what does that mean? Yes yeah, so when I came from Sudbury I was I had yeah five years university I had a phys ed and uh, a minor in biology and then I had a two-year education degree from Brandon where I did some coaching out there as well so I'd I'd been to school for a while and when I wanted to get into the outdoor industry, I just started looking at programs and I, uh, th there was a number of programs that let's say would range from one year to, you know, four years. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I wanted to take one year and sort of get the bread and butter of, of, of certifications and try and do it fairly quickly and then get my experience out there. And mm -hmm. so that, that's what I did. I, uh, I worked, I went to the Canadian tourism college in Vancouver Okay. And it was an eight month uh, diploma program that I took there. And, you know, when I looked at what they're offering, it had everything that I, that I, that I wanted. And at that time, uh, stand up paddle boarding was, wasn't around. So it was, mm -hmm. it was sea kayaking. So I, I got my lead sea kayaking certification, my wilderness first aid. I took some sort of outdoor um, interpretive courses, some business courses, and it was, mm -hmm. it was sort of perfect. And then, as I said, I was, I was hired up at a wilderness lodge in the Great Bear Rainforest. So I started working and, and guiding up there. And then, you know, Does through that the winter, include things like uh, whitewater rafting. Uh, I, I did a little bit of whitewater oh, rafting okay. training, but the, it was mostly based on the coast. So it was mostly a sea kayaking, oh, okay. hiking type focus for that, for that training. So yeah, it set, set me up well. And uh, if it wasn't for that uh, college that I was at, I would never would have got that phone number for, King Pacific Lodge. And when I gave them a call, they were looking for a wilderness guide to start up their programs. And I was fortunate to be uh, hired up there in Git Gat territory. Oh, wow. Right place at the right time. Exactly. And I, you know, I, I've always believed that, you know, once you get on a, a path that's your own and that you're passionate about, you know, the world conspires to help you out along that path. So I think uh, everything really started falling into place when I, when I came out West and, and started following my dream. Now, I read somewhere today, you referred to it as the West Coast mentality. Now, since I've come back to Ontario, I definitely feel like <laughs> I'm outside a little bit often um, of the, the regular train of thought. I'm curious what your definition is of that, because I'm still trying to figure it out. I yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a great question. It's uh... I think it's just a different mentality out here on um, what maybe what you value, what, what the values are out here. And I think for me, it always comes back to the land and, you know, you've got the mountains, you've got the, the ocean, you've got the river. So even just between the mountains and the ocean, you have these two real power sources in terms of land and in terms of environment. So I think, when you spend enough time in these types of environments, you realize you're pretty small mm -hmm. within that environment, right? And you realize there's a much bigger world out there, a much bigger picture, I think, with some of these things. I think it keeps us, it keeps us humble. And, you know, that West Coast mentality, um, I think you really value you know, what you're doing day in and day out. You're, mm -hmm. you're really connected to the moment. You spend a lot of time you know, being connected to that moment. And these days, we're all trying to, you know, even myself, you know, working on meditation, but there's nothing better uh, meditatively than, than, let's say, surfing, hiking in an old growth rainforest, paddling down a river. Those moments really can keep you connected to those moments. And I think mm -hmm. that's part of that West Coast lifestyle is that you realize what you value, what's important to you in your life, and, and you really want to follow those things. And in some other areas, you know, maybe 
uh, you know, it was laid out, well, this is what you're supposed to be doing nine to five in terms of work. And, um, you know, we have this work focus, this money focus, and, and you realize there's a lot more to it than that. And mm-hmm. I think what COVID-19 has done has really awakened people into what's important in people's lives. Uh, mm-hmm. We realize we don't have to be in these big cities anymore because people are now working from home. Yep. Um, the whole home office thing has really changed right? We're taking courses online. So I really think that traditional mentality of, you know, working nine to five and working from Monday to Friday, that's, um, uh, we seem to be moving away Mm -hmm. from that and doing things that are really important to us. Because as you get older, you realize time is short. Mm -hmm. uh, And we're not here for a long time. So hopefully we're doing the things we love and enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. And you're 44, correct? No, I am 51. What? Whoa. Yeah, 69. I know. I know. Wow. I, 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 yeah. Okay, that was an older article then. I was thinking for some reason <laughs> I was reading a 2020 or 2021 article. Okay. I'd be wow. I'd be happy to go with 44 though. Wow. I'm, okay. I'm go with that. <laughs> so you are my my senior a little more than I thought. So yeah. I got to tap into some of that later because I'm at a similar place where I'm sort of looking at what's next and I don't want to necessarily continue the grind and so I yeah and I think I think even with age right it it that mentality changes with your age and I think you know even coming from uh, you know sort of where I grew up like you thought okay when I get to 55 I'm going to retire like Mm -hmm. you know I'll have 25 30 years of, of work under my belt and then at 55 I retire and there was this process that you sort of we're, we're set up to go through. And I think when you're really passionate about what you do and you love what you do, you know, I, I think we're fortunate to, for every year that we get to. And I think even the age mentality changes. And I think these days with, um, you know, health protocols and, and, and being healthier and, and natural ways of keeping yourself uh, strong and fit, um, those ages have, have been changing uh, mm-hmm. 50, I think now or 40 now is a lot different than what it was for our parents probably. Right. So yeah, absolutely. Um, even that West coast mentality changes your age, I think yeah. as well. I remember when my mom turned 51 and she was not riding paddle boards. So <laughs> no, I figure you know, you, you got to keep moving. You, you got to yeah. keep the body moving, right? Because as soon as you stop, as you get older, it, it's a, it's harder to get it going again. Yeah. So some of that West Coast mentality. So so a few very tangible things I've noticed, um, not all just about the mentality, but a few physical things I, I actually realized when I was living out West that I missed. They were uh, thunderstorms and the sounds of crickets. you know if you're listening to this it sounds crazy but those two things just didn't exist in vancouver i don't know maybe on the island and some other places in bc no yeah i think you know out on the west coast i I agree with you um you know although i love being out here in bc my roots are still in Sudbury. my roots are in the canadian shield and i think wherever you grow up and spend enough time in you know, you're molded by whatever physical environment that you grew up in. And so that old rock, you know, 4 billion plus years old, the lakes, uh, it's still to this day, one of my favorite places. It's the reason why I get back home every summer to connect with Mm -hmm. friends and family and to spend time on the lakes. But out on the coast here, because we have more of a moderate climate, we don't have sort of that mixing of colder and warmer air. You just don't Mm -hmm. get the thunderstorm activity. Uh, as, as much as you do out here. And I also, you know, I sort of miss, I mean, we have seasons, but it's, they're, they're not as obvious mm, as the seasons yeah. you would see in, you know, let's say in Sudbury and Northern Ontario. So I, I sort of miss some of the seasonal side of things as well. And you certainly have to get used to uh, precipitation. Yeah. And funny being back here, I was also really stoked for the winter and having a proper winter with snow and it just, it was here and now it's gone. And everyone is acting like it's not coming back. And I'm going, wow, okay, it's over already. Like I was expecting more intensity. I mean, it could come back, but people are very happy about that. But it was not very subtle at all. Um, you know, just like sort of night and day. 
Yeah, I think these things happen faster now, right? Mm, with the, yeah. you know, the climate change and just, um, you know, the unpredictability of, of the weather. So it, it, it does happen quicker. And even the temperatures are not as cold, right? In Sudbury and yeah. places like that, that, that they used to be. And I went back a couple of Januaries ago. I hadn't been back in Sudbury in, in January for a long time, but I, I, I realized how much I missed the sun, like the, mm. the bright blue sun with the white mm. snow. And it's it, it just in my blood. And it felt uh, really good to be out just snowshoeing and cross country skiing and, and hanging out in those, those conditions. So yeah, it, it's absolutely. still in your blood, you know, it is interesting how, yeah, your origins stick with you. I mean, I don't live on Lake Erie anymore, but I was on a conversation today to join the Lake Erie challenge. It's just sort of, what you grew up with really sticks and it remains important to you. So. Yeah. And I think you realize that as you get older again, I think mm. you realize sort of where you've come from and how things come around full circle. And, and like you, you know, you've come back to, you know, Owen sound and your family. And uh, you know, I, I think about that a lot these days as well, mm. you know, yeah. family and where I grew up and uh, it's part of who we are. Yeah. So back to the east coast west coast thing one of the things on the other hand now that i think you'll appreciate for me uh starting a, a job here was i was very used to the doing land acknowledgements like constantly mm -hmm. like in mm -hmm. vancouver I, you know any meeting we had there was a land acknowledgement mm -hmm. i came here and the only ones i've heard are the ones i've done on my podcast so yeah. Yeah. That is something that came to me while I was out West. I don't even want to say it came to me while I was out there because I took an interest in that stuff a long time ago. I actually went to school on a reserve in Ontario um, for native studies. Mm. But so that was part of my story. And so that piece really worked for me well in Vancouver and all the relations and the culture and all that stuff. So to come back here, and Owen Sound is right around a few native reserves, um, but it's, I just haven't felt that connection here the way I did out West. And obviously you have tapped right into those communities. Yeah, I, you know, I think, again, I think that was for me something when I came out West that, uh, you know, I was really attracted to it. It just, it just felt right. And I think definitely growing up as well in Northern Ontario, um, I've always had an, an interest in the land and then the people of the land. Mm -hmm. um, I remember playing hockey at a young age and playing against uh, the Waquemakong Hawks. And so they always had an incredible hockey team. And I think that was the first time, you know, I had met uh, uh, one of the kids from Waquemakong and I remember connecting with him on the ice. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was always trying to think of, you know, how far back for me that, you know, some of that history and that connection went. And of course, when you come out, out West, you realize again, and this is probably part of this West Coast mentality too, but it's much more obvious that these First Nations communities along our coastline have been living off the land and, mm -hmm. and harvesting off the land for, for a long time. It, it's more obvious and it's all tied up again, I think, into the land, the mountains, the lakes, the, the oceans, just those power sources. And it's a different way of looking at the land and, and, and respecting the land. Mm. So now when I come back to Sudbury, I take that same mentality and, and I'm just now, I'm, I'm really curious in the areas that I paddle in Northern Ontario. One of my favorite places is Killarney Provincial Park. And so I, I think back, well, what are the old trade routes there? Who was on mm. the land? What, what First Nations community is it? And I have a number of First Nations friends in Sudbury as well. And um, it's just always great connecting with them and yeah and, and 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 understanding the cultural history of the place yeah absolutely so what is your kind of early memories of being on the water here what was it that led you eventually to stand up paddleboarding and everything you're involved in today uh, my first connection to the water would be at my grandfather's cabin it was on the Wanapate river so just outside of Sudbury, it was about 20 minutes outside of Sudbury. And we were really fortunate, uh, my brother and my two sisters, to spend our whole summer there. So, you know, once mom and dad finished teaching and we we're out of school, we get in the big Chrysler station wagon, wood paneled station wagon, and we'd head to the 
head to the camp. And there was, there was nothing better than that. My grandfather had built the cabin. And so my earliest memories really uh, were being in a canoe mm -hmm. with mom and dad. And I loved to fish. And it, it was so long ago that I didn't even have a fishing rod. All I had was this wooden block with line tied around okay. it up <laughs> that my grandfather had given me. Wow. And I think my earliest memory fishing was trolling, you know, trolling that mom and dad were paddling the canoe and I was trolling the line behind it. And we ended up getting a nice pike. Mm. And of course, the net we had had a hole in it. So mom and dad, I think mom tried to net the fish and we lost the fish. And I still remember that. It must have been traumatic because I've never forgotten it. But uh, yeah. So that, that's where my love for the water came from, was, was being on, on the lakes and the rivers there. And of course, it's, it's cottage country, right? All of my buddies yeah. had camps as well. So you tend to spend a lot of time in the summer at these places. And then I think that, um, you know, when I came out west, I just had this natural draw to the ocean. And I really had a draw to surfing. And I'd always wondered where that surfing connection had come from, why, why I love surfing, because even before I got out west, I was buying all the surfing magazines and had all the surf pictures and I knew all the, all the guys surfing. And, and then it was a couple of years ago that my dad sent out a picture to me and it was from Sabo Beach. And it was me standing in uh, with my bathing suit on and I had this styrofoam surfboard under my arm and dad said oh yeah you got that from canadian tire we bought that for <laughs> you and he said i think you got one wave on it and it snapped in half and that was it oh wow. but i was like wow it must have been a pretty good wave because it had to have come from that moment you know yeah. my my love for surfing so once i got out west and started surfing and just you know having that ocean there it was just it was just uh, something else and and um just love being connected to the ocean and anytime I spend any amount of time on the ocean, I'm, I'm learning something and, and you're just connected to a much bigger energy source and it's, it's therapeutic. It's meditative. It just makes you feel good when you're out there. Absolutely. So you left around 1999, 2000, you went out West. So was there a plan or did everyone think you're crazy leaving a teaching job or probably all of the above? Yeah. Um, I, I, I did have, you know, I, my, my plan was to uh, get my guiding certification. So mm -hmm. I knew I was heading out for that. I think a lot of people, maybe even back in Sudbury thought, wow, this is be a one year thing. And then normal come back yeah. to Sudbury. And, you know, I'd always get people ask me, well, when are you coming back, when are you coming back? And um, I, I was out there, I didn't know I was out there for good, but I think I'd found, you know, I'd found a place uh, you know, for, for my heart and for my soul. And it felt really, uh, felt really good. It was my own path, I think, which is, yeah. which is what was really important for me. And, and I was learning a lot and, and I really enjoyed what I was doing. Not to say I didn't like teaching, but I just think, you know, we talked about timing before. And I, I think, you know, things show up in your life at the right time. Mm -hmm. And that was just the path that I was on. And so, yeah, that was 99 and, you know, things probably would have been different if I didn't get that job up, up in the Great Bear Rainforest. I, you know, probably would have found something else, but I connected to some amazing people out there and it was a, a brand new playground for me and just so much to learn. And, um, you know, I, I still every day waking up, I feel good and happy, excited to get out of bed and start the day and, and, and plan trips and, you know, uh, provide stuff so people can get out and connect uh, yeah. to the land themselves water now the great bear rainforest yeah it's on the mainland it's on so the mainland, yeah. yeah it's on the mainland so th they refer to the great bear rainforest as this area that stretches from the northern tip of vancouver island so if you're going okay. to go to the mainland from the northern tip of vancouver island you're sort of in that night inlet sort of northern northern gulf islands type area maybe it's the southern part of it and then that track of land goes all the way up to southeast alaska so the up to basically prince rupert and so it's a really large track of land that comprises oh, okay. the coast mountains um you know the 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 ocean the rivers and that we've got 25 percent of the remaining intact rainforest left in the world wow. and especially in that north coast area where i work it's even more intact up in that area and the further south that you come in 
you know, down along the coast in BC, you know, the more logging and the more industry that you're going to see. So mm-hmm. the Great Bear Rainforest was a term given to that area by, uh, I think it was Ian McAllister's father, possibly Ian McAllister, who uh, him and his wife did this trip back in 1997, where they sailed the whole coast and went into every inlet and river and documented the wildlife and salmon and um and and had an amazing book called the great bear rainforest and so they sort of coined this term the great bear rainforest but within that our whole coast is broken down by territories right by first nations territories yeah so the territory that i work in on the north coast is the simshian territory and and specifically the gitgat clan which Mm -hmm. is uh where hartley bay is uh, okay that's the area that I that I work in and so is that where you found surfing or would that be kind of sheltered in there that's right yeah that's sheltered so it's in the uh swell shadow of Haida Gwaii Mm -hmm. right so if you go west from Prince Rupert or uh, that Hartley Bay area you're going to go across Hecate Strait and then you're going to run into Haida Gwaii so most people a lot of people know of Haida Gwaii it's 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 a pretty, pretty popular place and so there's some incredible surfing um, on the north coast of, of Haida Gwaii there. But my first surfing happened uh, in Tofino. That's oh, where, okay. uh, you know, when I first uh, first came out west, I, yeah, started. I, again, it was early, so I wasn't stand-up paddleboarding. So I just started surfing. And it was, uh, yeah, Tofino that we we're uh, heading to for, for the surf. Okay, so you were working as a guide. Um, yeah. but then you were traveling to Tofino and that's when you found surfing. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. That's uh, so, you know, I spend most of my time guiding in the summer. So I would say, you know, the beginning of May till the end of September is usually when my season went. And then once that season wrapped up, we'd uh, yeah, we'd make a trip out to Tofino. Uh, the winter swells and the fall swells started to come in you know, the best surf season there generally is the fall to the spring Mm -hmm. uh, on the coast. So yeah, we, we'd head out there and, um, and surf. And it was, it was fantastic. It was, uh, I remember some of the great fall surf trips that we would have out there and there, you know, few things are better than, you know, being in the surf with close friends and, and enjoying, enjoying those uh, West coast moments. So at this point in time, though, you didn't have a reputation. You weren't Norm Han expeditions <laughs> um, or anything like that. No, I mean, yeah, no. I uh, I was I was just trying to follow my passion. That's yeah. what I was doing, and and I, I think that's um, yeah. I was I was really aware of the decisions once I moved out west of the decisions that I was making to make sure I was, I was making them for the right reason. And I think because I didn't have a lot of experience guiding, um, again, I was fortunate to work up in the uh, at King Pacific Lodge up in the Great Bear, but that was four months. So I still had eight months to try and find, find work. Mm-hmm. And so I would really work on a lot of contracts and try and take as much work as I could. Anything that came up, I would, I would grab and, um, and work and, and what I didn't have was a pension anymore. I didn't have <laughs> yeah. uh, medical, right? So those are, you know, those are some yeah. of the things you value when you have, you know, a teaching job, right? And so, um, so I, you know, I, I had to go after those, those contracts and, and take what I could. And I still sort of have that mentality where, you know, if any opportunity comes up, I'm, I'm trying to grab it. But, uh, uh, you know, I'm trying to be a little bit more specific with, with my time and, and what I'm doing. But yeah, back then I was just, I was just trying to get experience and trying to be a, a really effective uh, guide. And of course you can get the certifications. It's sort of like for us as paddle Canada instructors, right? You take an instructor course and it's, that's just a key that gets you, that opens the door. And then it's mm-hmm. up to you to get experience and to teach and to, yeah. to get clients and to work with people, because that's really where all the learning is mm-hmm. and that you can't buy that right? Yeah. You can't buy that experience when you're out on the West Coast guiding. You, you need to earn that experience. And, and um, you know, you try and find the right teachers, the right mentors, get the right training. But then after that, you have to go out and, and get some experience. So who were, who were those people for you then in those early days? Yeah. So there was a, a guy named Bruce Wilson, and he was uh, one of the instructors and one of the guides at the Canadian Tourism College. 
And uh, I sort of connected with him right away. And he was really one of my big mentors uh, when I first came out. And I really tried to model what I was doing after what he was doing. Mm -hmm. Because not only was he a very skilled, technically skilled guide, but he really had that human factor. He understood people. He cared about people. He really understood leadership. Uh, he valued the land. And so it was really a lot more of the softer skills versus the hard skills that I really respected about Bruce. And uh, mm -hmm. we still see each other here in Squamish. And, and uh, he was a big, he, he played a big role on, on sort of my guiding trajectory out there. And then uh, the other people were, were the GitGat people. Mm -hmm. So when I first started to work at King Pacific Lodge, um, I was working side by side guiding with, with the people from Hartley Bay. And that was, that was really an eye opener just in terms of the learning from them. Yeah. And again, understanding the land, uh, understanding the stories of the land. And it was just, uh, it, yeah, it's still to this day, you know, the, the learning from our first nations yeah. is so important. Do you think there was a moment of, uh, what's this white guy doing here teaching us or were you uh, just so I, humble and receiving of that traditional knowledge? Well, I, I think, I think what's important when you come into these communities or certainly when I came up there, you, you don't talk, you just listen. And I mm. think that'll get you a lot farther <laughs> um, just by listening. And so, I mean, I've always been fascinated by, by the story. So, you know, as much as I could listen is what I would be learning in these communities. And I really think in a lot of these situations, you know, when I'm working up there, I always view them as a partnership, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and I can understand certainly due to history, what it would be like having a, 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 another white person coming in to the territory. But I think if you do it properly, and if you learn from them, and, and most of the learning is built around respect. If you can bring that respect, not, not only in those communities, but really in anywhere that you go, that's going to take you a long way. And yeah. so, right. It's just like going into a surf break in some other, you know, country or, or state or territory or what have you. I mean, if you're coming in without a lot of respect, you, it's, it's not going to take you too far in those breaks. And I think that's just a universal value that we all have to remember uh, and approach when we go into to new areas and new places and meet new people. Yeah, I agree. So on, I watched Stan today and there's a scene in there where there was a ship that had crashed somewhere. And I think Raf was surfing and you could see this ship in the background. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I do. Yeah. So, so what is that called? Yeah. So that, that was interesting because, uh, Anthony Bonello and Nick Tykrob, who, who produced the film Stand, they had that section with Raf. And what they did was they transposed wrecks of the coast that they found historically and sort of put it in the background when Raf was surfing in some of those, those colder yeah. and darker surf sections. So there wasn't actually a boat in there. They just, oh, okay. they just transposed some of that, bringing that message you know, of, of storms and the coast and, and, and surf and, and a lot of the wrecks that we've had on the coast, because, you know, when looking at that project, you know, they were proposing these super tankers to come through the Great Bear Rainforest, which were basically the size of the Empire State Building. So they're, mm -hmm. you know, absolutely massive ships. And when you look at the history of ships on our coastline, right? And the number of ships that have sank along our coastline, it's a really, really rugged coast, a challenging coast, winter storms are, are brutal. And so that was sort of the message that we were trying to get across oh, okay. the, the threat to these boats uh, through our weather. There was another mention of a BC ferry that went down somewhere. So, okay, so none of those ships are sticking half out of the water or anything like that? Uh, there, there's probably a few of them around okay. for sure on the coast. And that BC ferry was interesting, right? Because that was, it was the people from Hartley Bay who mm -hmm. came out and rescued everybody off of that BC ferry, which, uh, which sank, I think that was back in 2006. So that, you know, that's 
that was a probably about a half an hour boat ride south out of Hartley Bay. And they got the Mayday call at 12 o'clock at night. And they all went out to rescue the people off that boat. And it took yeah. Coast Guard, I think, an hour and a half to get to the to the scene. So the the fact is that if you're traveling on our coast in large ships, even today with all the technology that we have, that uh, human error will happen. Yeah. And there's the risk of these ships crashing and spilling. I'm not going to lie. I'm a little disappointed to hear that that ship isn't real. The one that was, <laughs> because when I saw that scene, I thought, wow, if there's ever a reminder of the danger that's coming or even just uh, colonialization in general, I thought, wow, that is a powerful image, but okay. It, it is. And that, yeah, it's probably better that it's not there anyhow, but well, <laughs> the, 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 yeah, the, the ship is real. It just wasn't at that place where you okay. saw it uh, on the film. Um, I've actually guided on the west coast of salmon fishing on the west coast of Haida Gwaii. And you talk about a high energy coastline and, and they've, got, uh, they've got a ship out there on one of the outer islands that you can actually uh, see the rusting remains of that ship. So they're, they're all over the coast, all up and down the okay. coast. Uh, yeah. So I watched Stan today and I asked myself, why haven't I seen this before? And I guess the answer is only because I wasn't paddleboarding when you, when you filmed that. Otherwise, that would have been on my radar. What mm -hmm. an awesome movie. You've already touched on it a little bit. So you know, tell us a little more. But, but the premise, really, for those listening is you paddled the proposed route of the, the Enbridge pipeline? Um, the, the very first trip that I did was back in 2010. And it was a expedition we just called Stand Up for Great Bear Expedition. And that was, you can see that one on uh, YouTube. So if you Google Stand Up for Great Bear, you'll be able to see that one. It's about 45 mm -hmm. minutes. But that was the first trip that I did. And the one that you just mentioned paddling from Kitimat and heading down to Bella Bella. So I visited the four First Nations communities. I wanted to paddle the tanker route and see really what was at risk mm -hmm. uh, for myself. And then it was a couple of years later that Anthony Bonello had approached me and he was a filmmaker and said, hey, we, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd like to do a film. I think we can bring this message to a larger audience. Stand Up for Great Bear was you know, the, the first goal of that was not to create a film. Uh, mm -hmm. My goal yeah. was just to get on my paddleboard and go paddling. So, you know, we had some handheld footage and, uh, you know, something like that. We were able to sort of cobble it together and, and create this stand up for great bear show. But when Anthony approached me, he was bringing a different level of expertise and professionalism to it. And so he had wanted to, in that stand up for great bear film at the end of it, you'll see um, some of the health sick, uh, students who had built wooden paddle boards. And so that was sort of the first class that built these paddle boards. And um, Anthony wanted to continue to follow that and sort of sh show that message. So in Stan film, uh, he had asked me, do you want to retrace the tanker route? I said, well, we, you know, I already did that. I said, I really <laughs> like to go and check a new place out on our coastline and, you know, see another area that might be oh, affected. Okay. So uh, we went over to Haida Gwaii for that. And I paddled from the top of Haida Gwaii. Uh, we left from Old Masset, and then we headed down to the World Heritage Site at the south end, where, where you see those uh, poles, those totem poles. Uh, and then uh, Anthony and Nick Tykrob, who uh, Anthony brought Nicholas Tykrob in as well, and so they they both worked on that film, and they also wanted to showcase the students. So mm -hmm. you see the Helsinki students in that one again. It was the second class that built these wood paddle boards and just a great part of the film right watching mm -hmm. these uh first nations kids building their own wooden paddle boards and then paddling them and then it had raft ruweiler in it i actually i just talked to raft this morning because we're looking at putting a trip uh together but uh raft who's a real you know coastal man grew up in tofino you know born and bred uh yeah. one of the godfathers of, of of surfing sort of on our coastline uh, really well respected his family and, you know, showcased his connection to the land, his connection to the surf and, and just showed some of his amazing surfing and really showcased some beautiful areas on our coastline. And so those three stories were brought together in, 
in stand film. And I think we were fortunate because, you know, I think when you do these types of projects and again, when you've got your passion going into these types of things, I remember we were, we had a screening and a gentleman approached me and just said, Hey, you know, I think, uh, love the film. I I've got some connections with Netflix and, you know, I think we can maybe get it on Netflix and, oh, wow. Sure enough, that's what happened. We ended up getting a contract for Netflix. So it really took that film to a, a larger audience, which was mm. amazing. That's, that's what it was all about, was just to try and get the message out to a larger audience. And even though, you know, I think with Stan Film now, we've been successful all, and, and really as a result of the First Nation saying, no, we don't want this project. Um, there was, but there's a lot of people that, that did support that. And um yeah, it was, it, you know, it was successful, but I think even now people still watch it and there's still a message in it. Right. And Absolutely, it, it, could, yeah. it could be standing up for the great bear rainforest, but really it could be standing up for anything that you believe in or, or any threat to, you know, your backyard or what have you. So we're using this film now still in schools. I think we're into our, we have a project uh, called take a stand for conservation. Mm -hmm. So we take that film and I, I do a presentation on the Great Bear and we go into elementary schools and high schools and share that message of the coast and of protecting what you love. Mm. So originally, your original route you did from, was it Kitimat to Bella Bella? Yeah. On the mainland. And then yeah. your second route was along the coast of Haida Gwaii. So both it. are essentially would face the repercussions of an oil spill if there would be one yeah that's correct and a lot of people you know may or may not know or remember the exxon valdez spill but when you come out to the coast and you're in bc at some point you'll hear about this exxon valdez which was a big oil spill in the uh, 90s that they had up in alaska and so if you're to take the impact of that oil spill and the amount of territory it covered and transpose it onto our shoreline, which you see in stand film, mm. right? It pretty much covers our whole coastline. But uh, what's unique about our coastline is all of the fjords and inlets and islands that we have. So it's not one continuous straight coastline, right? We've got, you know, if we've got four or 500 kilometers uh, as the crow flies, let's say from Vancouver to Prince Rupert, that might be 400 kilometers four or 500 yep. kilometers but if you're to look at the actual length of coastline you can probably quadruple that you're probably wow. close to 16,000 kilometers of actual coastline yep. um, and then we've got really large tides on our coast right so 20 to 25 foot tides so a mm. lot of moving water in some of these inlets and rivers that tidal water is going to move you know 150 kilometers inland so yep. there's a really really huge impact that any spill um, or, 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 yeah, or, or, or any uh, impact may have on those uh, in the intertidal zone and in that sort of that boundary between the ocean and the rainforest. Yeah. So the idea with the pipeline was the argument to not have the pipeline go through that route or to not have a pipeline at all? Like, are there people who were proposing it you know, go out more, more north and straight into the water rather than around all those islands and, and such narrow ways? Yeah, I think, you know, the reason why they, they wanted to put it in there was because it was much more direct. Mm -hmm. And so they would be able to get that oil moving a lot quicker, let's say, than coming out of Vancouver and then having to come up the coast and, and head over to China. But, you know, I really focused on the sort of the ocean and the waterways from, from Kitimat down to Bella Bella, Haida Gwaii, but where the uh, oil sands are in Alberta, right? That, that's a thousand kilometer uh, route that goes from Alberta to Kitimat. And, mm -hmm. it, and it, uh, it crosses over, you know, hundreds and hundreds of, of salmon streams and through numerous territories. So the impact is not only obviously along our coast, but you know, the pipelines also have spills, not just the tankers, but yeah. the, the pipelines have spills and breaks and they break down. And, and so there's also a big impact there. And I think when, you know, the, that route was shut down, then it really forced a lot more pressure to that, 
you know, the pipelines on the South coast mm -hmm. and, and Keystone and, um, you know, pipelines, you know, coming in and out of Vancouver, um, looking at increasing production. So, you know, I guess the downfall of that was pressure in, in other areas. And I think, you know, there just hasn't been any oil tanker traffic up there, you know, mm -hmm. uh, forever. So, you know, yeah. to think about trying to send these tankers through these areas, it was just a really bad idea. And I don't think they consulted properly and effectively with our, our first nations people. And so yeah. um, the other thing that was happening while I was doing that trip was there was that BP spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. So even if people didn't remember the Exxon Valdez, people were watching on, you know, CNN, Fox news, uh, the BP spill happening. And here's this pipeline that's ruptured in the Gulf of Mexico and it's spewing thousands and thousands of barrels of oil every single day. And they actually couldn't put a stop on it, if, if you remember. So that really woke up, I think, our people here on the coast because um, they're watching it happen real time and they're going, well, they're, they're, this is what they're proposing for our coastline. So yeah. like, no, we don't, we don't want this. And every, you know, I went into the four First Nations communities on Stand Up for Great Bear, uh, Kitimat, Hartley Bay, Clem 2, uh, and then into uh, Bella Bella. And, and every place that I went to there, everyone was just adamant that we can't have this on our, there was just way yeah. too much at risk. Now, for those who don't live on the coast and maybe listening to this and sometimes are of the mindset, oh, it doesn't affect me. What would an oil spill actually do? What kind of devastation would that cause? And what ripple effect would that have across the country for people who aren't living on the coast? Yeah, I, I think we have to realize these days that and, and, and the First Nations have known this for everything, but everything is connected. Mm -hmm. if, if there's one thing you learn when you, when you come on the coast and you spend some time with the First Nations people is that everything is connected. So that ripple effect is true. What happens here on our coastline is going to ripple across Canada, across North America. But I think in the bigger picture, we have to really look at how we're taking care of our environment. Mm -hmm. And I think it's becoming more well known now that Hey, we, we've got some major issues that are happening as a result of, you know, the, the warming temperatures, what's happening in the Arctic regions. Um, and so we're going to feel like what happens in the Arctic, we're going to feel here on our coastline. We're going to feel here through, uh, you know, through throughout Canada. And I think we just need to be, um, you know, doing the best job that we can to look after these types of places. The our coastline and, you know, areas in the Great Bear Rainforest. They're beautiful, they're remote, they're pristine. They still have First Nations communities that are traditionally harvesting off the land. So I think as we go into the future, wild places like this are gonna become more and more important as yeah. our world starts to grow and starts to expand. Yeah. And, um, you know, I remember, I can't remember which interview it was from, but it was one of our coastal First Nations people. And the question was asked, well, you know, what difference does it make if there was an oil spill? Like, how would you guys be affected? Yeah. You know, speaking to the coastal First Nation people, and they just said, well, we'd just be like you. And it sort of, you know, sort of took a while for the, you know, to, to understand what he meant by that. But they're still living their traditional way of life, mm -hmm. right? And if anything happens to their traditional way of life, then what do they have to do? They, they can't live in these places anymore. They have yeah. to go to city centers like we do. Right yeah. where, where we live, and we can go to the grocery store, but their grocery store is in the ocean. Their grocery store is where the river comes into the ocean, mm -hmm. and their seasons revolve around those harvesting seasons. So, uh, to come back to it, it it we we have to understand that our whole ecosystem is connected, and you know as the uh, health of the ecosystems decline, eventually our health starts to decline. And in a way, you can see it with this pandemic that we're dealing with now, right? Like, you know, some of these diseases and some of these viruses, you know, may be coming from who knows where they're coming from. It could be the destruction of the rainforest. It could be a lot of these different things. But we realize we need to, to make sure our ecosystems are connected. And we need these ecosystems for our health, mm -hmm. right? For our mental health, for our physical health, 
for our spiritual health. Um, and so it's really important that um, we support people who are looking after these environments. Absolutely. When you got into guiding, did you ever imagine yourself becoming such a conservationist or at the, the front of some of these things? Um, no, not at all. I, okay. I, I just knew that, you know, I, I've just always known that I've, I've, you know, I love the outdoors. I, you know, love the animals. I, I'm, I'm really interested in all that stuff. So I think, you know, I think that's why I just uh, related so well with our First Nations people because they, they had values that I, you know, that I want, that I had and mm. that I wanted to learn, you yeah. know, learn about and, and, and learn a little bit more deeper on, you know, and I still, you know, I still don't view myself as a, as a conservationist. I'm just passionate about mm. looking after these places. Um, and for me, it was just individual because I had spent, you know, a number of years in these communities and, and working. And there were places that gave me so much that I was like, you know, what can I do to give back? And I think that's, you know, really what, what I wanted to do. And so people, a lot of times I'll get asked the question, well, you know, what is it that I can do? You know? And I said, well, what I asked them, what are you passionate about? You know, what is it that you're passionate about? So Derek, if you love surfing on the great lakes, and there's going to be some threat to that break or to that area, then, you know, you've got something invested in it as do other people. And so you've got a voice, you've got a podcast. This is what you're doing right now to help, you know, maybe in yeah. talking with me to get the bigger message out. Right. So yeah. we all find our areas of, of expertise and our areas of passion. And that's, that, that goes a really long way, I think, mm-hmm. into, you know, into getting, getting things done. And, um, you know, in 2006, I was adopted into the First Nations, into the Hartley mm-hmm. Bay community um, by Eva Hill into the Raven Clan. And when I was given that name, they said, this name carries a great responsibility in our territory. And, you know, I'd never forgotten that. And I didn't actually know where that responsibility would take me. Mm-hmm. But when the opportunity came up of potentially paddling the tanker route and trying to do what I could, it wasn't until a few years after I'd done that, that I realized that that was an opportunity for me to use that responsibility mm-hmm. to do what I could yeah. to, 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 to look after a place and people. And so it. your spiritual name you were given was Tam Lam, which means steersman of the canoe. And I find it interesting. You weren't even paddleboarding yet. Exactly. And, and I think when you look into that name, it is, it's, that name was given to me by a 90 year old matriarch in, in Mm -hmm. Hartley Bay. And um, when I, it it was just such an appropriate name Yeah. because like the story I told you about one of my first memories of being on the water in Northern Ontario is in a canoe and being in Northern Ontario, you know, the canoe and the paddle, that's, that's the mode of transport right Mm -hmm. on our, yeah. Uh, northern Ontario lakes and rivers and the portaging and all of that so you know growing up canoeing um, that was one area and then the second area which not a lot of people know about is I played for the Laurentian Voyageurs right Mm -hmm. and I I love I yeah I love (laughs) basketball right yeah and and we took a lot of pride in calling each other Voyageurs because the Voyageurs were just you know they're hard-working French uh, fur trading canoeman. Yeah. Right. And so I remember, you know, one of the pictures that I, I got, um, was the, a picture of the voyageurs and I, you know, our logo, right. Our, this, you know, canoe with the voyageurs paddling and it's such a iconic picture. And then I, so then I move out West, right. And end up, end up getting this name. I was kayaking at the time, but get this name in 2006. It wasn't until 2008, two years after that, that I started stand up paddle boarding. So when you look at that paddle, that, that canoe paddle or that traditional paddle and that name is yeah. really representative of, of who I am. Absolutely. And my values are. yeah. And I think it's another landmark in your story that shows you you're on the right path. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And I, I, you know, 
that's a prominent position, you know, steersman of the canoe to be at the back of the canoe mm -hmm. steering. That name was, was given to me for the work that I was doing in, in Hartley Bay, uh, coaching and, and teaching. And so, you know, it was, you know, one of my proudest moments, um, in getting that name, that that's probably the thing that I hold, you know, dearest, uh, to me is that, is that name. And yeah, it's, uh, so that paddle is, Definitely a uh, path of the paddle, right? Yeah, well, that's cool. Yeah. Um, on the topic of stand, so some of the scenes of you paddling by yourself in the vastness, it was so impressive, like the beauty and all the space around you. Um, and some of the, uh, the holy sites you went to. Um, maybe tell me about that. I have this, I'm envisioning myself kind of, coming up to shore and being all alone with these totem poles around. I mean, what did that, what does that feel like? Well, I, you know, I think what Nick, Nicholas and Anthony did a great job of, of in the film. And I think why it's been so popular is that it moves people emotionally, mm -hmm. right? So like you're describing, you, you can sort of feel yourself being on this wild coastline and being by yourself and, and paddling. And I think, you know, for me, that, that's where I'm most at home is when I'm out there paddling and you're on this remote coastline. And again, we had talked about it earlier, but you're just part of something much, much larger yeah. than, than, than you. You, you, you know, you get taken outside of your ego pretty quickly um, and you, you know, you connect to these areas. And my big uh, reason for going over to Haida Gwaii was I really wanted to get to these watchman sites. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to paddle along that coastline and come into these watchman sites because one of the things I find uh, always so fascinating about our coastline is coming into these areas where people have been living uh, for thousands and thousands of years. Yeah. And so we're now dating back inhabitants on our coastline, 15, 16, 17,000 years of, in some areas, continuous use. And we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're still finding um, you know, more cultural history. And so whenever you come into these types of places and, you know, the most famous one was probably the one you saw in the film, that's a place called Skung Gwai, And that's at the bottom of Haida Gwai, mm -hmm. where you paddle into this small bay. And yeah, it, it, I, it, it's, it's hard to describe that feeling of paddling into that bay and seeing those totems and walking up to that, that shoreline and being in the presence of these totems, but mm -hmm. um, it, it's a very powerful feeling and yeah. a very emotional as well. And so you can feel the presence right in these areas and, and in these areas that have uh, this old land that's been, mm -hmm. that's been used by the people. And, and uh, it's, it's addictive, like that feeling of wa always wanting to be out there yeah. and to be exploring and to, to, to search for these areas. Um, on Stand Up for Great Bear, one of the, I, I had uh, the First Nations people from each territory accompany me on that journey uh, through their territories. And if I didn't have them on those, ter you know, coming with me, I wouldn't have known half the things that I, that mm -hmm. I saw on those trips yeah. because I really wanted to know, you know, where did they harvest salmon? Where did they collect, you know, clams and cockles? Where did they, you know, they showed me burial sites and pictographs and petroglyphs and brought the whole area of the whole land alive to me, right? And, and, and taught me the cultural history of the land. And as soon as you start looking at land like that, it really changes your perspective on it. Mm -hmm. So like you coming from BC back to Owen Sound and yeah. sort of having, you know, the land acknowledgement and, and, and really understanding some of the First Nation stuff out mm -hmm. west, you bring that same mentality back with you to Owen Sound. And so you start looking at the land a little bit differently that's true it's like what first nations community lived on this lake or on yeah. this river or on you know northern georgia bay right and mm -hmm. it really changes yeah it's it, i i really like that feeling of of understanding a place better culturally and i, I it's one of the things i enjoy doing is reading about cultural history mm -hmm. uh, on our coastline and uh, anthropology and archaeology and the history of the land and the people. Yeah. You know, seeing that scene, it just made me think, wow, I don't need to go to Easter Island or Stonehenge. Like 
I need to get back to the West Coast and go on that tour because just to, I think just to sit there under those guardians. And I mean, even the name, the guardians, to know that there is such a thing as these guardians there for us all. It's just so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Haida Gwaii. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of people know about Haida Gwaii is because mm -hmm. you're able to go over there um, and especially on, uh, you know, South Moresby Island, where a number of these watchman sites are, you know, you can go on these tours where they'll take you to these sites and the watchmen are there. So again, I was fortunate. I paddled into these spots and I would wow. like, land it on the shoreline. The guardians would, would meet me and we just sit down and talk and then they'd yeah. take me through the land. Right. And if, if you weren't with them, you wouldn't see how, you know, most of the stuff that's there because it's, you know, covered in moss or trees or there's some poles. I mean, yeah. the most, the most obvious one was the one down at Sk Skongwai, but there's some other ones where you can just see old house beams and, mm. and they would bring the place alive. And um, even without seeing that you could feel it. And mm. man, it was, yeah, now you're getting me excited to go back to, to Haida Gwaii. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> so, you know, and I, I th that's the beauty of film is that, mm. you know, a good film like that will take, take people on a journey and, and get as close as you can to what that feeling might be like in those areas. And then, you know, the next best thing is to go out and experience it yourself. And yeah. I think that's how, you know, a lot of the trips that I do, out here in BC, that's what it's about. It's just providing people an opportunity to connect to, to these, to these lands and to these waters and to these wild places. That's why I like going up to the great bear. I want to share with people, uh, what I've learned. I want to, I, I want people to meet the people, uh, that I've met up there that have had a big impact in my life and, and, and to experience these wild places. And you realize that, especially these days, uh, you know, how much we need the land and the water and, yeah. and uh, because it really teaches us a lot about ourselves. So I spoke with the president of Swim Drink Fish Canada last week. His name is Mark Matson, And in his process of, you know, saving the waterways, if you will, the number one step is connecting people to the water. And I just thought that was so fascinating. I hadn't really looked at it that way but getting people in a relationship with the water is the first step in saving the waters because if you don't care you're not going to do anything and so it sort of dawned on me that you know as a stand-up paddleboard instructor like yourself sometimes it's easy to think oh I'm just taking people out teaching them how to do a you know a cross draw or a sweep stroke this and that but really that like you're saying there's a lot more going on there and who knows what kind of connection they're forging or the memories etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah i you know again when you reflect back on the question you asked me about who one of my mentors were you know bruce wilson when i first came out west um you know we have the opportunity anytime we're teaching right it's a it's a, it's a privilege for us to be in this teaching position mm -hmm. and even if you look at paddle canada and what we need to be teaching Right. Generally, there's, you know, we got to teach safety skills, we got to teach technical skills, and we there's some knowledge stuff that we have to go in there. But other ways of learning outside of you know the skills and the knowledge, something we can always be passing along are values. Mm -hmm. Right. So if I come take a course from Derek, what are Derek's values about the water that he's teaching on, or that let's say Owen Sound, right? And I think those are the biggest takeaways for people okay. because you know we, we we can find instructors and teachers that can teach us certain technical skills and, and yeah. knowledge but we always i think we always connect with the teachers who who are also teaching the you know sort of the bigger picture things mm -hmm. and and teaching about values and we've yeah. got this opportunity it's a unique opportunity somebody's you know paid us some money to to come and take a course from us and you know, sometimes it's hard to write that up in the description on your website, yeah. but all you need to do is get them in the course or on the trip. And mm -hmm. so a lot of people may come on my multi-day trips and not, not even realize what they're going to get from that trip, yeah. right? Because now it's my opportunity to interpret. And that's why I need to continue to research and study 
you know, the cultural history and, and, and interpretation and the connections of, of the ecosystems and wildlife, because that's what really brings these places alive and changes people's perspectives on them. So, you know, the greatest changes you'll see in people is not really with skill sets. It's in their own mentalities, mm -hmm. right? And, and if you can provide that for, for people, then they're going to be, they're going to be pretty happy because they've, they've taken something away from your trip or your course that, you know, they weren't quite ex expecting. And uh, these, these trips are always an opportunity for self development and yeah. self growth for people coming into these areas. And that, that's why I love, that's why I love teaching. That's why I love yeah. guiding. And I probably feel the same way. Yeah. That's a lot to think about. I, I like what you're saying. I'm thinking about my product descriptions for my courses and, you know, they, it's sort of an afterthought. They have a one liner. I think that says, in the beautiful waterways of Georgian Bay or whatever it is. It's not what the focus is, but you're right. When you get out there on the water, it's kind of a different story. It's the, the, the uh, Great Lake is your oyster, if you will. Yeah, and even before moving out west, I mean, I've always loved Georgian Bay. I love that Killarney area, Manitoulin Island. I mean, the other place that I spent a lot of time was on Lake Superior. Mm -hmm. And you talk about a place that has a presence and yeah. has an energy to it. Um, I, I love the Great Lakes. And, and yeah, uh, every time I go back to Sudbury, I, I get out to that Killarney area on the Georgian Bay. And man, it's a really, really good feeling because for me, it's connecting me back to the land that I grew up in. Yeah. And I think, you know, for people that are able to teach on in those areas, there's a, an amazing story to tell. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and at the same time, just a little bit of marketing. I mean, some people aren't always interested in taking a course, mm. right. If you yeah. say, Hey, come and take my course. Like, I don't want to take a course, yeah. but if you say, Hey, come paddle the, you know, traditional waters of the Ojibwe people um, and, and, and spend time connecting, mm. um, and, and that's what your values are. And that's yeah. what they're going to take away from it. And at the same time, you're going to teach them a few things and, you know, everybody, everybody wins. And I think we, we, it's also important for us that we understand these things. We yeah. understand these values because these values are going to be import, more important as we move forward. I think, um, you know, in society, especially what's happening. Um, you know, I mean, we're, I've got a seven-year-old and, uh, it's, we're doing all we can just to keep them off the screens. Mm -hmm. Right. And we spent, we, yeah. we, you know, Jen and I, we spend a lot of time in the outdoors with them, but it's really easy just, you know, with the TV and with the, the screens and social media and video games, it's, wow, it's really easy to do it. But, um, yeah. you know, we need to continue to, to get people out on the land and on the water. Connecting for sure. Yeah. I'm going to put that advice in my back pocket. I really like that. Um, yeah, values, bringing your values with you to your courses. Now, you offer almost every course under the sun. I mean, you're doing basic stuff, advanced stuff, river stuff, all kinds of stuff. But what's really cool listening to you is, although you're teaching, I know it's cliche, but it sounds like you're always learning as well. Yeah, I think, you know, great teachers and great uh, instructors and guides that's, I think that's what we love about the profession too, is not, not only are we able to share what we know, but we're, yeah, we're always learning. And if, if you're with an instructor who's not, then it's probably not the right instructor, I think, yeah. because all of those great ones are, are in a continual state of learning. And that's, that's what I really enjoy. And there's just, for me, there's just so much, it, it's such an amazing profession because there's so many areas that you have to be to have some expertise in uh it's what i've always loved about stand-up paddleboarding as well as the various disciplines and I've, I've wanted to try and be effective in all of those disciplines that stand-up paddleboarding offers so i like the racing i like the river paddling you know the the basic flat water stuff of course the touring and the surf so i like doing all of them and i think you know our our environment also dictates what area you're going to spend the most amount of time uh, in. So because I like the ocean, I spend a lot of time sort of on that touring side yeah. of things. Um, but every time we run a river course, man, all I want to do is paddle rivers all, all yeah. summer. You, know, you get wow. excited about it. Surfing's the same way. Um, so yeah, we, you know, we try and offer 
try and offer a lot. And in all of those areas, you, you got to keep, you got to keep learning and got to keep growing. And I think that's a big part of what, uh, what also keeps us young is that lifelong drive to, yeah, be doing new things and, and learning new things. Yeah. I think now, Norm, the one thing I do really want to know about, it's a little different from everything you've been talking about. You've yeah. got a paddleboard, man, with your name on it. I do. Yes. Like, how does that feel? What is the deal with this paddleboard? I mean, if I were to put Derek Hyatt on a paddleboard, <laughs> I'm going to really believe in the performance of this thing or whatever. Yeah. I, you know, I, I've been, in, I've been fortunate to work with some great companies. Um, you know, the company right now that I'm working with is, is Sonova. So they're a really uh, creative brand. They, they make a all wood board out of polonia wood. And so I've been fortunate, I think as well, just because of my background in expedition paddling that, you know, with these companies, um, you know, to be able to work with them to, to create a good product for people, mm -hmm. a product that I'd be interested in, you know, that, that I would use for, for my trips. And uh, hopefully if they work for my trips, they're going to work for, for most people's trips. But, you know, when I look at brands, and working with brands, I, I look at brands that, you know, ha have a, obviously a good product. Uh, they've got good people behind the product. So people that you want to work with. And, and um, you know, and then the third thing is support. You know, they're going to give you good support. Um, and then the last thing for me is, you know, what are their uh, environmental ethics? How mm -hmm. are they contributing to helping out our environment? So, you know, working with Sonova and working with, uh, blackfish paddles they, they 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 check all of those boxes for me and so yeah having you know putting my name on a board is important because you know i i want to have a product out there that that's a good product it comes from a good brand and you can trust that if you see my name on it that it sort of checks off all of those boxes as well and you don't have to do all of that research you know you're going to get a you know a good 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 product to paddle on you know there's going to be good people behind that product and they're doing great things for the community and for the environment and um, uh, those are the types of partnerships that i want to get into you know when i'm working with with brands and and other companies because at the end of the day too derek there, there's a lot of choice out there in, in the products yeah. that, that we choose and so, you know, a number of the products that, that I've had and work with, you know, a lot of them also contribute money back to my stand up for Great Bear mm. Society, which eventually just then goes back into the uh, conservation and environmental projects in the yeah. Great Bear Rainforest. So um, people, yeah, I think people want to connect to people and products that, you know, and, and these values that, that they care about. And so. Yeah. I mean, that's something else we can do with our businesses as well, right? If people are taking trips and courses with us, we can take certain percentages from that course and, uh, and contribute to sure. local causes and, and, and those types of things. So yeah, I'm, I'm fortunate to be supported by great, great people and great products and, uh, and to be able to share those with people. That's kind of good to know. So if I see you, I mean, cause I've seen you representing, uh, by Kobe and Kokita mm -hmm. and a few others. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of cool to know that, Maybe those are norm hand vetted brands. Yeah, we've yeah, we certainly uh, yeah the Vicovi the, the <laughs> stuff we paddled in quite a bit. And I have worked with Kokatad in the past. I'm working with Mustang. So oh, Mustang, with, yeah, Mustang, and they're yeah they they make a great product and 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 really do some really do some great things. So yeah, it, it I mean you know when you work in the outdoor environment, you I mean part of that that gear is safety. That's number yeah. one, right? Is keeping yourself safe and keeping those people that you're with safe. So uh, it, it has to last. It has to be durable. It has to be good on the planet. Um, and so you just got to search those, those, those companies and products out. So the boards in your fleet, are they all Norm Han expedition boards or are they uh, different companies? What, <laughs> yeah, we've got, uh, you know, with a lot of the courses and trips that we do, the inflatables have worked mm. really well for us. So personally, if I'm paddling or doing I thought I saw fish, some bad fish. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I've worked, yeah. I work with bad fish. I've got some red paddle boards as well. And when I first started running trips up in the Great Bear Rainforest, uh, inflatables weren't really out at that point, or at okay. least not an inflatable that you would take up to paddle in the Great Bear. So I would, on a trailer, tow up eight hardboards 
right? Uh, oh, expedition okay. touring hardboards. Yeah. And then I'd put them in, uh, you know, onto a boat, off a boat. It was a really, really challenging environment. And then as the inflatable technology got a lot better and they started designing more touring style inflatables, we, we really started using those for a lot of our, uh, a lot of our programs just because they're lighter. I could pack up eight yeah. of them in the back of my truck and, and, and take them all over. But um, certainly for performance wise and speed wise on any of the big, you know, the big trips, uh, I'm using, I'm using the hardboards. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I've got four reds as well. They're great. And now didn't you work somehow with uh, Rita Boychuk on yep. the rivers? Yeah, yep, I, I do. So. Yep. So Rita, I just saw her last week and we've got a program that we're running here in Squamish in June called flat to flow and Rita Boychuk and one of my guides, Tina Curry, uh, they started that program last year, uh, really successful. Yeah. Three day river clinic. So we're, we're again doing it this year and, and yeah, Rita's, uh, high energy, great instructor. Yeah. Uh, a lot of her work is in, in Alberta on the Kananaskis river. Yeah. And yeah, we're again, I, I, I sort of like, you know, partnerships working with, with good people who are, you know, great instructors and are really committed to the profession of, of teaching and coaching and guiding. And, and, and Rita does that. So we're yeah happy to be working with her on that. And I'm sure there's going to be other uh, programs and projects we'll collaborate on in the yeah. future. Yeah. I know you do a lot of team ups because I remember seeing you also on uh, Catherine's site for Tofino paddle surf. I know you do some stuff with them as well. Yeah. That's our longest running uh, okay. course is that Tofino surf weekend. So I, I don't know what year we're into on this one. We've got that course coming up in April um april 9th i think it is and then we, we run one in the fall as well but okay yeah it's it's such a fun weekend and we get we get people out and teach them how to paddle surf but again it's it's bigger picture stuff right it's like hanging out in tofino you can't go wrong hanging out on the no. beaches in tofino and and surfing with friends and yeah. um so that's been a, that's been a great course for us so yeah I, I love partnering with people who are passionate and and um you know, I want to hang out with. Before I let you go, Norm, yeah. one question I have left for you is you've been to some beautiful spots. I'm curious to hear some of your, your favorite spots or, or the majestic, the majesty of certain places and maybe some of your most interesting wildlife experiences. I mean, I'm sure you've seen some whale tails, maybe even some closer encounters. Yeah, uh, for sure. Lots of, uh, uh, probably some of my, I'm trying to think of some of my favorite places, um, for sure. I mean, you know, that area in Gitgat territory in Hartley Bay, uh, where we do our seven day trips, there's, uh, a, an inlet that we paddle in. It's a place called Quelzu, and it's the first place we spend two days paddling in. And it's absolutely it's spectacular. Again, it has, has that feeling you know, when you paddle into the area and into the back of the inlet, there's an old longhouse back there, which has uh, some personal history for me. But that that territory is is just an incredible place to paddle for sure. Mm. Um, heading over to uh, Haida Gwaii, mm. right, going into that into that World Heritage Site, paddling into that little cove. I mean, that had to be one of the most unique and amazing places that i've mm. by moment that i've that i've been into yeah. and then um you know yeah uh so anywhere where it's remote mm. where there's not a lot of people around are, are great places for me and you know the more remote the places are generally the the more wildlife encounters that you're going to have mm. and so we've had some pretty amazing paddles with humpback whales being really close we've had killer whales pass right in front of our our paddling group at one time and in a lot of these rivers we we tend to go up to the great bear in the fall when the salmon are coming into the rivers yeah. so even just the opportunity with your paddle board to paddle over and through rivers where salmon are spawning yeah. right and then um you know up there we've been able to paddle up you know, watch bears feeding along the shoreline or feeding on salmon. And yeah. because you're on a paddleboard and it's quiet mm -hmm. and you're on your knees, 
Uh, we've had moments sitting on our paddle boards where a pack of wolves have ran right past us. Oh, wow. so all of those are happening up, you know, in the Great Bear Rainforest. But one of the one of the cooler uh, uh, experiences that I've had with killer whales actually was right here on the south coast in in Squamish, and we were out doing that film for uh, Blackfish. I'm not sure if you've seen it. It's called How Sound. I did. Yeah. Um, yeah, cool. So, you know, we're out paddling. We were just out for a day filming and we're out paddling around one of these islands, beautiful spot. And then we're coming back. And as we're coming back on the boat, uh, this was out in front of Britannia Beach, which used to have a mine and was one of the most polluted shorelines in North America, just due to all the leaching of the hard metals into the, into the water. And as we're paddling past Britannia, I looked up and I could see these blows and these fins. And so it was a pod of killer whales oh, that right. was coming into Howe Sound. And I, I've seen the killer whales in Howe Sound a few times, but it's probably been at least four years since I had seen them. But I always believe things happen for a reason, right? And when you want to get the right message out there, things happen. And yeah. we wanted to get the message out about how Howe Sound was coming back to life after mm -hmm. years of degradation. And sure enough, these killer whales come through and I hopped on my board and paddled with them for, for about half an hour. And then they had the ability to appear and disappear pretty quickly. Wow. And so they disappeared and we ended up getting back in the boat and we took the boat down into Squamish and, and followed this pod of transient killer whales who were in the sound looking for harbor seals and sea lions and just followed this pod all the way through and, and, uh, I remember one of the comments that Kelsey Thompson, who was the filmer of that, uh, we were in the boat. And he had actually made the comments saying, wow, the, the whales are too close. He had this red mm. camera <laughs> and was filming and the, and the killer whales came up too close. So, wow. uh, and then, so we got some really good footage of that. And that was sort of the cap of the, of that film. And yeah. whenever you have an apex predator, like a killer whale, coming back or you're in a river and you see a grizzly bear, right? These apex predators tell you that that ecosystem is, is somewhat intact or at least coming uh, back. Yeah. And, and so they're all really humbling experiences yeah. along with the rivers and the oceans and the mountains. Uh, another opportunity to stay humbled and realize how small we are on the big picture of things. Wow. Incredible, man. So, Hey, if anybody wants to go on one of these beautiful expeditions, how can they hook that up? Yeah, just you can just go to the website, normhand.com, and have a look at what we offer there. Uh, we've got a lot of, lot of products out here in BC. So, yeah, just touch base, say hello, and we'll do our best to, to get you out on one of our trips. Anything you're really excited about? Any new expedition you're trying out this year or anything like that? Yeah, I... You know, I had mentioned earlier that just with what's happening with COVID-19, we're not able to get up to the Great Bear Rainforest. So it'll be two years now that I won't be able to get up uh, there, which is, yeah. which is hard for me because as you know now, and people know that it's a, very, it's a place that's really close to my heart. Um, so I'm just looking at other trips. We've got a couple of trips lined up to the Broughton Archipelago, which is this beautiful maze of islands in between Northern Vancouver Island and the mainland. Okay. It's in Kwakwakwak territory. And so we've got a couple of trips lined up for there. We might add a few more. Um, just looking at adding a new surf trip with uh, Raf Brewweiler up on mm. the Island, which is a, an incredible place to surf. But uh, personally, I like, you know, Bruce Kirkby, uh, who's another fellow paddle adventurer. Him and I have been getting out the last couple of years to do some big trips. So we're looking at a trip on the West coast of Vancouver Island. And I, uh, I really want to get up to the Yukon as well. Mm. I did the Yukon river quest. Right. Okay. Uh, a few years ago, uh, we were the first group of paddle boarders to do that race. Oh, wow. and it was uh, the Yukon's an amazing place. So I'd, I'd really like to get uh, a, a wild, remote river trip going up there as well. Yeah. So I've, I've always got uh, I've got I've always got a few projects and a few inspirations. And a lot of times, you know, the books that I read on the coast will get me inspired about different areas. And then I got to go check them out. Yeah. I'm curious, um, when you're finished uh, this summer, what what sort of uh, changes you might see because of COVID? Like if there are more animals coming out or um, what looks differently just from this time? 
Yeah, well, they're interesting. I don't know if you know who Frank Wolf is, but he's he's a, uh, a Canadian adventurer. He's paddled his canoe and kayak and okay. all over the place. Actually, Frank Wolf has a film called On the Line. And mm-hmm. so while we were doing our you know stand up for Great Bear stuff, Frank Wolf had uh, a film that he had created called On the Line, and he actually walked, hiked, rafted, bike from Alberta to Kitimat, and then I, I ended up meeting him in Hartley Bay, and. Um, but uh, he paddled the coast last summer and he had a really interesting perspective on it because it was probably the first time in, geez, maybe a hundred years. I don't know how long where, you know, he paddled uh, self-sufficient with his buddy, Dave up the whole coast. And he said he had never seen the coast like that. There was no uh, boats out. Yeah. No people were out, right. Everybody was yeah. sort of locked down, but he was self-sufficient. So he didn't have to stop at any of these communities. Mm-hmm. And I just thought, wow. What, what an interesting perspective. It's actually in this uh, month's Explore magazine. We've got an article in there on the Salish Sea, but um, I just found that to be a really interesting perspective, paddling yeah. a coastline um, that hadn't been seen like that in wow. who knows how long, right? That is cool. So, yeah. yeah, some 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 uh, silver linings for sure with, <laughs> with yeah. what's been going on. And that's how you have to look at it, I think. Mm-hmm. I don't think we can dwell on what we don't have. We have to dwell on... Um, and, and focus on what we do have and, and, yeah. and those things that, that motivate us. And we're, the yeah, fact that we're I, still healthy to do them. <laughs> yeah, I don't feel like COVID has uh, affected my sup lessons negatively at all. Um, no. People are looking for something to do. They want to Big connect. Time. They're not going to other countries. So it's a great time to learn paddling. Yeah. yeah. Norm, awesome. if you're not paddling, what else are you stoked about, man? I know you like basketball. Yeah, I uh, haven't played basketball for a while, but uh, I enjoy the skiing. You know, mm-hmm. right here in Squamish, the Whistler is just oh, up the great, road yeah. from us. So we like like skiing and getting out ski touring. And our son's seven years old, so spending a lot of time uh, with him as well. And yeah, this winter has been, you know, a lot of planning as well for the mm-hmm. upcoming season. And the more trips and courses we offer, the more computer time and planning that you have to do. But we mix yeah. that with... Uh, yeah, getting out and you've got a little cabin in, in Euclid. So we do our best mm. to get out there so we can get out surfing. Oh, that's nice. Always just looking for some fun adventures with the family. I don't know how you ever leave that cabin at the end of the uh, time. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I know. I got to work at some point. I yeah. think if I, live, if I live there full time, Derek, I'd never get anything done. I believe you. Well, you know, after talking to you, Today, I am ready to get the hell off this computer, man. I've been on here all day. I got, I got to, I need to go connect. But uh, I thank you, Norm, for coming on so much, man. Um, Like I said, your name's been out there jostling around for me for a while. So I'm glad I finally got the chance to connect with you and and get to know you and hear your story and and share it with others. And yeah, thanks, man, for being an inspiration and for sort of carving the way and also showing some of us other instructors that you can really make a viable career doing this. Yeah, it, it takes a while, I think. And it, it certainly hasn't been overnight, you know, mm-hmm. to build success. But when you, you know, you work hard and you're passionate about something and yeah, you're always just trying to create. And I think if, if you have that goal and dream of wanting to teach and to instruct, you just got to stick with it and, yeah. and keep on it and, and it'll all work out you know, and again, I was fortunate with it, my timing and everything sort of coming together to support, you know, what I was doing and being at the front end of a, of this really amazing sport. Again, I think timing is, you know, timing is really key. And so I yeah. think if you continue to, to stick with it and follow it, then, you know, what better way to spend our days and then, you know, connecting people to the water, teaching people, you know, Absolutely. Um, looking, for that, looking for that next adventure. Right. So, uh, yeah, it was really great to meet you as well. And thanks for having me on here. And um, yeah, happy to support you and, and the listeners. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, once things ease up a bit and I can get back for a, a trip out to BC, I hope to see you out in the surf. Sounds great. Love to get in the water with you. Awesome. Right on, Norm. Thanks again. Mahalo for being here and stay stoked. Right on. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, Derek.